pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we pray for your presence in the person of your Holy Spirit. As we read the ancient words of Scripture, may they come alive in our hearing. But more, may we hear them as addressed to us, both individually and as the living body of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Listen to Scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, <laughs> this very night your life is being demanded of you. And all the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. The parable that I read to you just now it is usually referred to as the parable of the rich fool. But I have a question. What's so foolish about this guy? You know, today we would use different words to describe him, would we not? We'd say he was savvy, productive, prudent, diligent, industrious, wise, and visionary. Would we not? I think that he has all those things, those qualities. What was so foolish about him? You know, the same values he embodied were given to me by my parents. Save for the future, Brent. Think ahead, Brent. Work now. Play later. I remember when I graduated from graduate school and I started working on a real job, I remember receiving advice from many people that it was important for me to lay aside part of my income so that I might have a good, and the word was nest egg, I haven't heard that word lately, but a good nest egg when it came time to retire. You know, the advice was, get a 401k, Brent. And once again, the words we might use to describe this behavior or this advice is it's prudent, it's wise, and it's savvy. And so I ask again the question, what was so foolish about this man in Jesus' parable? What, you know, would not a better name for this parable be the productive farmer? The productive farmer. Well, that's what I'm going to name the parable, the productive farmer. You see, the parable of Jesus, though, is troubling because it challenges many of our values. It forces us to look at what we consider to be the most important things in our lives. It's troubling because it deals with you know, unexamined, the unexamined accumulation of wealth. And Jesus' comment at the conclusion of the story cuts like a razor. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich towards God. So this morning, I'm going to look at this very provocative parable. First, it's a unique parable, especially in terms of its style, and I want to look at its uniqueness. Second, it confronts our unchallenged and oft unexamined values. The question is, what was so foolish about this man? And third, it asks an existential question. Am I a fool also? Am I a fool also? 
First thing that we should notice about this parable is that it did not focus on the actions of the productive farmer. There's no condemnation of what he did. Rather, it was on what he thought. It was on his thinking. The farmer's productivity, his bigger barns, were all props for this narrative. The focus that Jesus had was on his self-talk, what he was saying to himself. You see, the parable was not about building bigger barns for more crops, no. It was about human motivation. It was about the heart's desires and fears. What was the productive farmer thinking about? What was his motivation? What was, that's what concerned Jesus. You know, this was what Jesus' message focused upon. Human motivations, your motivations and mine. Why do we do what we do? And at the core of our motivations is the spiritual question, what is the most important thing in my life? What is most important in our lives? The great 20th century theologian Paul Tillich described faith as an ultimate concern. He said, that which we place first, or our ultimate concern in life, in effect, is our God. What was first in the productive farmer's life? What was his heart's desire? I think this was the focus of Jesus' parable. Not what he did, no, but what he believed. The parable, as I mentioned, is unique in biblical literature because it's the only one where we actually enter a person's mind, we enter their head, and we get a picture, we hear what they are thinking. We enter the productive, far productive farmer's inner dialogue. And we learn what was important to him. We discover his motivations. We come face to face with his ultimate concern or his God. We're no longer distant observers watching from afar. Rather, we are intimate with his thoughts and with his desires. And so the question then becomes, are his thoughts and are his desires like ours? Notice the productive farmer's use of the first person pronoun. I counted them. You can go back and do it yourself sometime. He used the word I six times. And then my, the singular possessive, first person possessive, occurs five times, all in the space of two verses. What does that tell us about the productive farmer? It's all about me. All about mine, my, and I. His thoughts were completely self-centered. But we may argue, would this not characterize all our thoughts? Perhaps. But it also reveals the farmer's motivations. What does he desire? To have ample goods laid up for many years, to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. What does he fear? That he will not have enough. And what's important? Security and ample goods laid up for many years. And what's his ultimate concern? His own skin, his own happiness, his own stuff. Now he may be outwardly devout, really. He may be an individual who participated in ritual and appeared to be quite <clears throat> pious. He may have gone regularly to the temple to pray, but Jesus' focus was on his heart and the heart's desire. The productive farmer didn't love God with all his heart. He didn't even think about his neighbor. He was busy dreaming, planning, and building barns for himself. Why was this productive farmer a fool? You know, Jesus was no doubt familiar with Psalm 14, where it reads, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. Now, Psalm 14, I believe, comes alive in this parable of the productive farmer. You know, when we hear his thoughts, when we come to know the desires of his hearts, we learn there is no God in his life. 
It's all about me. As I just said, he may be outwardly pious. He may go to the temple for prayer. He may even tithe a proportion of his wealth. But in his heart, there was no God. He was indeed a functional atheist. I think the parable of Jesus challenges our values, our behaviors, and our thinking. I know it challenges mine because I'm two weeks away from eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> we all know that. Earlier this summer, I celebrated my 65th birthday. And one of the things that I did that day was check out my 401k. Technically, I have a 403b for those of you that are in the business, but it functions the same way. And as I looked it over, I asked myself, Brent, do I have enough there? Should I have a bigger plan? In other words, you know, if I put it in the words of you know, the parable, should I build bigger barns? Will I be comfortable in the future? Can I say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. I think we could need to add fishing in there and boating too. And it dawned on me at that time that our modern 401ks are the cultural equivalent of the productive farmer's storage Each of us knows our own inner dialogue. I'm confessing mine. I like to think that I've had a productive career in ministry and whatever I've put aside has been the result of hard work and prudent planning. But what makes me any different from the farmer in Jesus' parable? This is an existential problem I'm dealing with. The parable is like an arrow aimed at the heart. And the question that I ask is, am I a fool? I wrestle with this. And it dawns on me that's exactly why Jesus told this parable. He wants us to wrestle with these hard questions about our lives, about our motivations, and about our plans. He wanted disciples like you and me to grapple with what's going on inside our thinking and with our own motivations. The parable of the productive farmer challenges each of us to examine our own values, our own ultimate concerns, our heart's desires, indeed the investments that we are making in life. It reminds us that Jesus was not merely concerned about the outer trappings of piety. Christ knows our heart. And Jesus told this parable so that his listeners would struggle, indeed wrestle with what it meant to be disciples, and Jesus calls you and me to the same struggle. Now, too often we focus on the externals and seldom upon our motivations and our own thinking. I think this is especially true when it comes to wealth and to the accumulation of goods and other things. And I did not tell Ted to talk about giving away part of his goods, <laughs> but I'm right there with you. Interestingly, Jesus did not condemn the productive farmer for being a good farmer. I think he would have praised him for that. And for producing abundant crops. There's no condemnation there. There's no condemnation for the productive farmer building bigger barns. That's fine. He did not condemn the productive farmer for being savvy or prudent. That's fine. He did not product, condemn the productive farmer for his wealth either. It's not there, folks. No. The productive farmer was a fool because for all of his planning, for all of his savvy, for all of his prudence, he neglected that which is most important. And that's the condition of his soul. He accumulated things, and those things literally choked the life from his soul. Let me just say a little further. For the record, Jesus was never an anti-materialist. The core of the message of the New Testament is that God became material. He became flesh. And as a Jew, Jesus believed that God created the physical world and called it good. The Hebrew word there is tov, meaning there was goodness built into the very nature of things. He was familiar with the words of the psalmist, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
the material world is good and it belongs to God and we're to enjoy it. The Greek philosophers incidentally were anti-materialists, but not Jews, not Christians. Now Christ was concerned when we become obsessed with what we have and obsessed with what we want. Christ was concerned when our material pursuits become the dominant theme and control our lives. And you know what? This is not just an affliction of the very wealthy. It affects the rich, the poor, and those in between. And you may have noticed throughout the sermon, I referred to the farmer as the productive farmer, not the foolish farmer. I believe that we can identify with this productivity. And that productivity, I think, should be saluted. I think we can identify with this vision of more crops and storing them. And that's to be saluted. But if we do not recognize what is so foolish in this man, are we not fools also? Has contemporary discipleship missed the point of Jesus' teaching? The question this parable raises for the contemporary disciple is, what is our 401k? I think most of us are prudently putting aside part of our treasure for those golden years. Jesus reminds us that there is also a spiritual 401k. And this is perhaps the more important one. Should we not be thinking about our spiritual portfolio? Should we be not investing our other parts of our lives, investing in the health and welfare of others? Investing in a cleaner and more peaceful world? Investing in prayer and spiritual maturity? Investing in the next generation so that they can live in this world that God created? Investing in sharing the good news of Christ with others? We speak of being Christ-like. Well, Christ invested everything, even his life on the cross, for the welfare and for the salvation of others. Can we be Christ-like? When I read the parable of the rich fool, I personally found a great deal of uncomfortable identification with him. <laughs> Truth is, I wanted to back out of this sermon. But it was already published, and they told me I had to. <laughs> as we contemplate our lives, and as we invest for our future, the temptation is to think only of ourselves, only of me. The temptation is to think solely in terms of what we have, what we want, and what we think we will need. It's not about us. When this is our focus, we too are fools. Discipleship is letting go of foolishness and embracing the grace of Jesus Christ. It's an invitation, and it's good news. Amen.